Okay, super. All right. So our first speaker today is Hannah and Nyman, and Hannah is a um, she is a third year um, biomedical engineering student from the University of Limerick. So Hannah, I'll pass over to you. All right, I should have started sharing my screen. Can you guys all see it? All right. Yes. No. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. I see perfectly. Yep. Yeah, that's super. Perfect. All right. So uh, my name is Hannah Nyman. I'm a study abroad student currently at UL. So I actually my research is based back in the United States at the University of Wisconsin, um, and we're working on modeling skeletal muscle cell aging on a dish using human plasma and myogenic progenitors derived from human pluripotent stem cells. I know that that sounds like a lot. There's a lot of big words there. I promise it will all make sense in time. Um, so just to get started with a little bit of terminology you'll see throughout the presentation. Uh, myogenic progenitor, whenever you see that, think skeletal muscle stem cells. So these are stem cells which have been treated to become skeletal muscle. And oftentimes I will abbreviate human pluripotent stem cell as HPSC, just so that it makes the slide a little bit more visually appealing. But to jump into a little bit of background information, uh, the loss of skeletal muscle tissue with natural aging is known as sarcopenia. So when you think of an old person, you probably see someone who is rather frail, weak, their skeletal muscle has begun to deteriorate. This decreased muscle function and mobility is a common symptom that always accompanies aging. The prevalence of sarcopenia, depending on geographic region, is 5 to 13 percent among elderly aged 60 to 70, and then increasing to 11 to 50 percent among those above 80. Unfortunately, there is currently no effective treatment for muscle wasting. By understanding more about skeletal muscle cell aging, there is hope to retain muscle mass and function to delay or even prevent reaching the disability threshold noted in red on the slide here. So a bit of literature review. Serum is the fluid that remains after removing red blood cells, white blood cells, and clotting factors from the whole blood. Age-specific effects of serum on skeletal muscle cells have been demonstrated in a number of published studies through various experimental designs dating back to 30 years ago, including satellite cells, which are derived from biopsies of resident muscle stem cells in an adult, and serum from young or old human, satellite cells and serum from young or old mice, a muscle graft from young or old donor mice into young or old recipient mice, serum from young or old donor mice into young or old recipient mice, and parabiosis studies. The overall implication of these studies is that the, the blood's age matters more. <coughs> Transplanting young, healthy muscle stem cells will not have much therapeutic effect if the toxic old host environment stays uncorrected. In fact, transplantation may even be unnecessary if correcting the systemic issues alone can rejuvenate the host stem cells enough to make them regenerative again. So why we use myogenic progenitors derived from human pluripotent stem cells? Currently, there are not many studies on aging which use human cells in human blood. Those who do use biopsy-derived cells, which are challenging to extract and expand. Because they're relatively mature and coming from an adult, they have diminished muscle differentiation capacity and they rapidly undergo senescence. They rapidly die. This means that they're unable to display pathological events that happen at an earlier time point in muscle development. On the other hand, pluripotent stem cell myogenic progenitors are easy to prepare, expand, and maintain in culture. They also do very well for functionality assessment in culture and transplantation studies. However, a gap in knowledge still remains. There's a lack of a good model for natural human muscle aging. So our central hypothesis is that we can use human pluripotent stem cells myogenic progenitors or muscle stem cells to study non-cell autonomous aspects of skeletal muscle cell aging in an in vitro model. Non-cell autonomous aspects cover extrinsic factors from outside of the cells around in the environment. So uh, in order to do this, our lab has successfully derived myogenic progenitors from human pluripotent stem cells. So we grow these stem cells as a monolayer on plates, and then we transfer them into a suspension medium to make free floating easy spheres. These easy spheres are kept in expansion medium for at least six weeks. This medium is serum free, which is an advantage as reliance on animal components can be costly. We then passage these spheres through mechanical chopping when they grow too big for the cells in the middle to access nutrients and oxygen in the medium. At week six, we stain the cells for PAC7 expression to confirm that they are indeed myogenic progenitors and will be differentiating into the myogenic lineage. Then we dissociate and plate them down for terminal differentiation using artificial supplement B27. After two weeks with this supplement, we check for myotube formation. So 
Last summer, I worked on uh, a few different experiments. So we started by looking at old plasma effects on expansion rate. We first looked at how young and old human plasma affected undifferentiated myogenic progenitors in this spherical form. I selected easy spheres with similar sizes and cultured them in a 96 well plate supplemented with 20% plasma in expansion medium from six female donors per group, young and old, and monitor changes in their sphere volume for nine days by looking at them under the microscope and measuring the average diameter. As expected, young plasma increased sphere growth at a slightly faster rate than easy sphere supplemented with old plasma. Next, I took these cells from the previous experiment and dissociated and plated them for terminal differentiation and removed the plasma treatment. At days 0 and 7, I checked for PAC7 and MyoG expression, which are early myogenic markers. This is checking to see if these cells are committed to becoming muscle in, as they go throughout differentiation. Then at day 14, I stained for MyHC, which is myosin heavy chain, to check for mature myotubes. We'll talk a little bit more about this on the next slide. So here you can see an example of an image field which shows all the nuclei stained with hoaxed in blue the nuclei positive for PAC7 in green, and the nuclei positive for MyoG in red. For simplicity's sake, we will consider all cells who are positive for either PAC7, MyoG, or both to be committed to differentiating into skeletal muscle. We found that there was no difference between treatment groups in the cell's commitment to myogenic lineage. This means that the cells did not have any trouble activating for muscle differentiation, whether they were treated with young or old plasma. However, at day 14, we do see a difference. Here we can see that at day 14, the formation of mu muscle fibers stained with myosin heavy chain or MyHC, which is shown in green on the slide, is greatly diminished in cells treated with aged plasma. Pictured in green are the mature myotubes, and nuclei wrapped within these myotubes are considered to be positive for MyHC. We found a significant increase in cells positive for myosin heavy chain in cells treated with young plasma versus those treated with old in the undifferentiated state. Essentially, what this means is that cells treated with aged plasma did not have trouble activating for muscle differentiation, but somewhere along the lines, they ran into issues completing differentiation and forming these muscle fibers. So, Next, we did a completely different experiment and we tested the effects of young and old pooled human plasma on terminal differentiation. So instead of treating the cells while they were in the spherical state or their undifferentiated state, we treated the cells with plasma after they were plated while they were differentiating. So we took the human pluripotent stem cell derived myogenic progenitors and dissociated them and plated them for two week terminal differentiation. While they were differentiating, we supplemented them with young and old pool female human plasma, again from six donors. After two weeks, we stained for myosin heavy chain expression to look for mature myotubes. And we found that the cells treated with young plasma had significantly more myosin heavy chain positive nuclei than the cells treated with old plasma, which formed no myotubes and thus zero myosin heavy chain positive nuclei in this particular experiment. So um, since then, we're working on identifying which components of the human of the plasma are responsible for these differences in expansion and differentiation that we observe. Uh, so we're working on treating cells with heat and activated plasma and female sex hormones uh, to look at their effects and whether those could be responsible for the differences. And then further along the line, we hope to eventually uh, identify how we can correct these differences in plasma composition to promote muscle health. So I'd like to acknowledge the Suzuki Lab at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where all this work is based, particularly my mentor, Sin Rao Tay, uh, who is a PhD candidate there, the other undergraduate student working on the project, Madison Mueller, and our PI, Masatashi Suzuki. And at this point in time, I'd like to open up the floor for questions.